everyone, I'm Beverly Kirk. I direct the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative here at CSIS. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight here in the room and online. Uh, we have a bit of a shift in schedule tonight. Uh, our moderator, Senior Associate Nina Easton, is under the weather this evening, so I am doing introductions. And uh, Dr. Kathleen Hicks, whom you're familiar with, uh, who leads the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative here at CSIS, will be moderating in Nina's place. We are very, very pleased to welcome former New Hampshire Senator Kelly Ayotte for a wide-ranging conversation covering the Syria conflict, Russia, Iran, and other security challenges, as well as her new role as the co-chair of the just-announced CSIS Health Security Commission. Now first, a few social media reminders. Please be sure to follow us on Twitter. We're at Smart Women. You can follow, follow Senator Ayotte on Twitter. She's at Kelly Ayotte. And be sure to check out our Smart Women podcast and iTunes U course. If you're live tweeting, and we certainly hope that you are, please throw in the hashtag uh, CSIS Live. Now, if there should be a fire alarm that goes off, please follow my instructions. If something happens in front of the building, we'll go out the back doors back behind me here and meet over by National Geographic. And if it's behind the building, we'll go out the front over to the beacon and I'll buy everybody a round of drinks. Uh, <laughs> Our Smart Women, Smart Power series would not be possible without the support of City. And uh, City, thank you very much for helping us to amplify the voices of women in foreign policy, national security, and international business. And please welcome Kristen Solheim. She is the Director of Federal Gover Government Affairs at City. Kristen. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here, and thank you for joining us for another great event in the Smart Power, Smart Women, Smart Power series. City is proud to bring women together to discuss foreign policy, national security, and to convene a dialogue on some of the most pressing issues facing our world. And it seems like there's a new one popping up almost every day these days. So it's really great to have you here to give us some perspective. Um, today, we're thrilled to have Senate, uh, former US Senator Kelly Ayotte here. She can uh, touch on a variety of things that's exciting to hear about your new post here at CSIS. And um, at City, we operate in more than 100 countries, and our unique global footprint offers a diverse perspective on the challenges and opportunities in myriad economic and political realities all around the world. These challenges confront our daily us daily in our mission to provide financial services that enable growth and economic progress. So we feel very fortunate to have you here to talk about the aforementioned things and your, your time in the U.S. Senate as the first, US, the first female attorney general in New Hampshire and, as you, and even as the chief of the homicide prosecution unit. Uh, what a career you've had and you're just getting started. So thank you for your time and being with us today, and we look forward to a great discussion. Back to you. Thank you, Kristen. We really appreciate city support because it allows us to spotlight women who are trailblazers and thought leaders, and certainly Kelly Ayotte is a trailblazer and a thought leader. She served in the Senate, as mentioned, from uh, 2011 to 2016 and chaired the Armed Services Subcommittee on Readiness and the Commerce Committee on Aviation, Commerce Subcommittee, I should say, on Aviation Operations, among a number of other prestigious committee assignments. And as Kristen mentioned, she was the first woman to serve as New Hampshire's Attorney General. She's currently serving on several corporate and nonprofit boards and is a visiting fellow at the University of Chicago Institute of Politics. And as I mentioned, Dr. Kathleen Hicks, our Senior Vice President here at CSIS, is the moderator for the evening. So over to you, ladies. Great. Thank you very much. Senator Ayotte, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, there really is no shortage of things for us to talk about. So we'll, we'll jump right into it. I will just say that among the times we've met before, uh, one of them was while I was in for my confirmation hearing. So I'm actually quite glad that I'll be asking you the questions tonight <laughs> instead of the, that should go a lot easier for me uh, uh, than the last if time. If I can answer them remotely as well as you did in your confirmation <laughs> hearing, that this is gonna be a great night. That's very, very kind of you. Well, let's start. Uh, with what brought you to politics, as, as has been mentioned from your bio, 
before that time, you had been uh, a prosecutor, you had a legal background. You know, when did you know that politics would be something you wanted to pursue? I think, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm really honored to be here. And I think for me, uh, the, it was the understanding of having the impact between not just one case. So I, as you heard, I was a murder prosecutor. And in our state, I handled some, some pretty, pretty horrific cases. Uh, and I got into that from the private practice of law because I realized I could make a difference for people um, with the justice system. And then as I kind of moved my way up through the state attorney's general office, uh, eventually I, I spent a short period being legal counsel to a gov to our governor, and I, it was very short, it was about six months, and I realized I wanted to be back in the AG's office, and I became the second in charge at the AG's office, the deputy attorney general, and eventually the first woman attorney general in New Hampshire history. And what I realized when I got in that position is that public policy, what happened in the legislature, um, the ability to have a greater impact on uh, safety issues, then I was the chief law enforcement officer and the chief legal officer, and consumer issues, protecting consumers, that not only could you impact one case, but you could have a much broader impact and make a difference for people in their lives. And I, got, I just got the passion and the bug for it. Um, and that eventually brought me into running for office. And so that's why I ended up running for the U.S. Senate, and I kind of had this crazy background. In New Hampshire, the Attorney General is appointed. There's only a handful of states in the nation where the AG is appointed. Uh, and I actually was appointed originally by a Republican governor, but twice reappointed by a Democratic governor when I was Attorney General. So my first uh, run for elective office was really a different experience for me. Um, you know, to run for the U.S. Senate for your first run for elective office it was one of those situations where um, it's kind of good to know what you don't know and just jump in there and do it. And I still believe it is a very important calling to find some way to serve um, and to make a difference to solve problems for people. And that's what drove me to public service to start with. It's why I'm engaging with CSIS uh, on this Health Security Commission, and even now in the private sector, you know, looking for nonprofits I care about and being part of because, you know, it's always one person who can make a difference on issues. So that's what brought me to it. We have in this um, electoral cycle a wave of women, it seems, who are running for yes. office for the first time. Uh, what kind of advice have you been giving them? Uh, what, what sort of yeah. have, have they, ha, do they need to realize or think about as they look ahead to the electoral cycle and then maybe to serving? Yeah, I think it's great that so many women are running. And frankly, uh, every time I talk to a, a group of women, I say run because no offense to my male counterparts, but I used to like to say when you know people would say, well, how come there aren't more women in the Senate? I mean, there's actually been uh, you know fewer than, I think, 50 in the history of the country that have served in the United States Senate uh, women. And um, I, I think our male counterparts look in the mirror and they see a senator, um, you know, they see a president, you know, everyone's <laughs> running for president. And often with women, we need to be asked. When I ran for the U.S. Senate, there were people who asked me to do it that I had a lot of respect for, including my predecessor in the Senate, Judd Gregg. Um, and I'm not sure that I would have thought of myself in that position had I not been asked. So to the women who are running, they've already gotten over that hurdle. They put their hat in the ring. Um, but I would just say to you know believe in, they, they got to this position because they're smart, they're knowledgeable, they have a vision for what they can do, whether it's at the state, local, or federal level. And don't let anyone push them around um, to be who they are, uh, to really speak their mind, and to remain strong. There'll be times they'll face criticism that isn't fair. Uh, and sometimes they'll be criticized on things that maybe their male counter counterparts will not be. I think you need to expect that, unfortunately. Uh, that still exists out there. But I would just say, hold your head up. Um, and you know, be who you are, because I think that's really what people are looking for, more women leadership. I think they're looking for people who are genuine, 
uh, and sincere in why they want to serve and make a difference. And so I think so many women candidates are throwing their hat in the ring. But I'd like to see more. I see a few in this audience that might, <laughs> might think about uh, running and you know, think about your accomplishments already at this point in your life. You're ready to run for office and, and, and help us make a difference and solve the so many problems that we're going to talk about tonight. Politics in the United States today is a little, little dicey. You have a reputation as a bipartisan individual. Is bipartisanship alive and well? How should we think about it? And how should we think about the state of American politics? Well, I think uh, I really hope that bipartisanship is alive and well. It's one of the things I worry about for our country. And I, I say our country because it's not just an issue of the Congress. It's not just an issue of our politics. It's an issue for each of us because we've become more divided as a country, whether it's geographically, geographically whether it's economically, uh, whether it's through our beliefs. And we've, I think, at times forgotten the commonality we have as Americans and the values that we share. And so I think that we see too much polarization happening in the Congress. And in fact, a lot of the central, if you look at more of the centrist members, m many of them are still even now still retiring. Uh, so I hope, uh, we, I haven't yet figured out how you're going to solve a major problem with one party. Um, if you look at our history as a country, if you look at the major pieces of legislation and those that have been passed without creating great acrimony among the population, it's generally the bipartisanship that gets it done. It's the bipartisan legislation that has lasting effect. Um, and it is also, I think, more a reflection on the American people. Uh, so I hope it, I, I know that many of my former colleagues in the Senate, um, they're good people. They want to work across the aisle. And I would just say to those who aren't in public office, too, what can we do in each of our daily lives to kind of reduce the acrimony, reduce the division, and find the common ground that we share among each other? So how do you see that playing out in our foreign policy? Or do you see the, the sort of internal divisions or however you'd like to characterize where we are playing out in our foreign policy? Well, I think, you know, I think right now in our foreign policy, you know, it used to be in the Congress that you know, the divisions uh, stopped at our shores, right? And that when, for example, I, I was traveling on foreign, uh, with, let's say on the Armed Services Committee, we were traveling to Afghanistan or some other place in the world, uh, and we'd usually be doing that on a bipartisan basis, uh, that, you know, we tried to really represent our country as a whole overseas. Uh, I still think that there is a bit significance to that that exists, I know, among many of my former colleagues and that, you know, I still keep in touch with and I see them and how they work together um, on foreign policy issues. And the Armed Services Committee is a great example. Almost every year they pass out the defense authorization on a unanimous basis with both parties. Uh, and that has continued no matter you know, which party is in charge of the Congress. Uh, that said, I think there are some real divisions right now in our country about what is our foreign policy, what do we stand for, um, in the sense that um, you have a discussion from the administration and the president really an America first policy, and you have a much more, uh, I think, traditional view of America's role in the world of not being necessarily uh, American first policy, but certainly one where we are a preeminent player and a very strong player, uh, but one that has a broader global outreach. And so I think that we're seeing some of that, not just within the Republican Party, but also even to some extent in the Democratic Party, as we look at uh, wh who do we want to be, what do we represent in terms of our foreign policy, and what's the best approach for the United States. I stand sort of in the camp that um, when the world is a safer place, America is a safer place. And I believe that we are, um, whether we want to be or not, we are the indispensable nation in, on many of these issues. That doesn't mean we don't, we do everything ourselves. I think that's the wrong approach. We build um, allies. 
we, we, we build relationships, friendships, allies, and we build coalitions to address issues. And I think, you know, the recent strike in Syria is an example where working with our partnership with the, you know, with the UK and France, that was a good example where instead of just acting unilaterally, we were able to use our position also to bring allies together to address, obviously, uh, what was a horrific chemical attack on the Syrian people. So you were pretty tough on the Obama administration's uh, counter-ISIS strategy. You had, I think, your own, ISIS, you had your own counter-ISIS strategy that you put forward yes. as a senator. Mm -hmm. How would you assess the Syria policy and the Trump administration's counter-ISIS policy right now? Yeah, I think we're, um, first of all, we've done quite a bit. I've appreciated sort of the, the renewed military focus on really uh, shrinking ISIS's capability, uh, obviously the rollbacks in territory um, and what ISIS is capable of right now. There have been significant gains in really um, destroying ISIS's capability. Not them, because I think we have to be very concerned, as we are with Al-Qaeda, of uh, their ability to reconstitute and their ability you know, to drive um, you know, other types of attacks beyond holding territory, but are working obviously not only with the Iraqis, but uh, the Kurds. We've had success and I've been happy with that. I think the question is what comes next? And, you know, the concern is, you know, not just taking the territory back and really defeating ISIS uh, or the core of it. They're still obviously in existence like Al Qaeda, um, but, what, what comes next in terms of our, our Syrian policy and um, especially as we think about if we do not have a next act and a strategy and a bigger plan uh, for what happens in Syria, then we have a lot of potential for downsides to our country and to our allies, including um, the reconstitution of ISIS and ISIS sort of 2.0 that actually General Mattis has expressed concerns about. We have concerns, obviously, with um, ceding more territory uh, to not only um, a murderous regime, Assad, and what he's done to his people, the humanitarian disaster and the displacement and the refugee crisis that we're facing, but we also have the ceding and the really taking of more territory and control from Iran um, and, and Russia. So where I would say the question that I have for this administration is, yes, you've done, I think, a, a strong military job of really shrinking ISIS and its capability, um, but what comes next after the recent attacks and response to the chemical, um, you know, the, the chemical attacks in Douma? So we took out um, their not all of their chemical weapons capability, but what is going to happen in terms of almost the next day Assad was bombing again uh, using conventional means and using, um, you know, obviously his air capability. And without a broader strategy, the risks that I just laid out are really there for us. And once we're engaged in something, you know, we don't have as much as we would like to the luxury of just fully walking away when um, the consequences are fairly grave uh, with the issues that I just identified. And I saw the administration today talking about, you know, engaging our Arab allies to have them engage in putting together a force uh, that to help stabilize uh, Syria. I would say the more we can engage our Arab allies, that's good but I don't think we're going to be able to do it without some U.S. continued engagement as well. Um, I don't think we'll be able to count on just them right away suddenly going on their own and being able to uh, provide the humanitarian assistance that's needed to also uh, provide motivation for Assad so that not further territory is taken to get him to the, the negotiating table. Um, so if we were suddenly to withdraw our presence, I think it would be very difficult to get Assad or to get the Russians in any, or the Iranians in any position where they would care. Um, so 
I think that we need from the administration a much more cohesive policy about what comes next. Part of the in, in, in cohesion, incoherence uh, we saw in this same set of circumstances this week uh, with regard to the UN um, Ambassador uh, ha Nikki Haley coming out um, to indicate the U.S. was going to put additional sanctions on Russia and then the president rolling that back. What's your view both of that particular instance of having an administration not sort of coherent internally, what are the effects of that, and then more to the point on the policy issue of Russian support inside Syria, what's your view on how we should be uh, treating Russia and talking to Russia about these issues? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I've, I've really admired the way um, Ambassador Haley has conducted herself at the United Nations on behalf of our country. And um, if you think about her uh, having gone from you know, governor of South Carolina and really jumping into these very weighty and important uh, foreign policy and national security issues, um, I very much admire the job that she has done at the United Nations. And um, you know, this is where if we are going to have a strategy, it has to be whole of government. And you, we've seen, unfortunately, instances where one part of the administration is saying one thing, like the Secretary of State, and then we've had you know, the administration, whether it's the national security team or the president saying something different. That doesn't obviously help advance our interests in terms of the clarity with which we want both our allies and our adversaries uh, to view our country. I kind of, I stood in the camp where I thought that the proposal and that Ambassador Haley made and discussed about imposing additional sanctions on Russia for its support of Assad's program, uh, chemical weapons program, made sense. We have, if we have any diplomatic means that we can use to drive at least uh, Assad to the discussion table, and we're obviously with that going to have to bring the Russians to the discussion table um, over a more stable outcome in Syria, uh, then we should use every lever of pressure that we have that is not military, because that's we already know that we are prepared to take military action because we've taken it. Uh, so that's one thing I would yeah. hope that, I, as, as I understood what's happening, the administration is still thinking about those sanctions, and I hope that they will follow Ambassador uh, Haley's lead because I think it makes some sense for us to act and act swiftly and with clarity. Uh, I also um, think that in terms of what the Russians are you know, doing, in Syria, we have to keep up. Uh, we've obviously, in other contexts, in response to uh, their nerve agent attack in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. in response to uh, you know their interference with our elections, uh, and also in response to their overall bad behavior in Syria and uh, in Ukraine, and and other other areas around the world, including their violation of the INF Treaty, um, you know, we have engaged in, for example, dispelling the, the diplomats and imposing uh, sanctions on oligarchs that are close to Putin. I think those are very, very good steps. And we should, we should go again to our allies, both uh, our European allies, and really get them on board to continue that economic pressure uh, on Russia. Mm -hmm. Um, to get Russia to the point where uh, they will come to the negotiating table and bring Assad to the table. Obviously, I think all of us would like to see Assad go. I know I would. But we're now post in a position where uh, we have to find some means for stability there. Um, while we're doing this uh, diplomatically, I do think we're going to have to still keep the military pressure up or they're never going to come to the table. And that means continued U.S. presence. Um, that means that we make it very clear that if you continue to take more territory, you continue to um, engage in bombing the civilian population, that we're going to be prepared to act. If we don't have both of those pieces, both the diplomatic pressure and at least that they understand that we still have this military pressure, 
I don't know what's going to bring either Assad, Russia, or anyone to the table uh, to really come to at least some plan to find some stabilization for the refugees, for uh, also there's a huge issue with the Kurds, I mean, mm -hmm. and so. I want to come back, you, there are several threads in there I want to come back to, certainly Russia. Um, but before and Iran. But before I do that, I don't want to let the moment pass without um, getting your thoughts on this issue of the role of Congress and authorization for the use of military mm -hmm. force. Do you feel that the administration was well within legal bounds to undertake the strikes they just took, um, or and or do you think Congress needs to set the table differently with regard to this conversation around the authorization that we have today? Uh, yeah, I th do I think that the administration had the authority to to go and um, issue the limited strikes that they did with our partners to respond to a chemical attack or essentially a, a, a WMD issue? Yes, I think that authority exists. In terms of the authorization for the use of military force, this is a broader issue for the Congress. And in part, the Congress needs to look in the mirror on this because if I think the perception, rightly so, from the president and the administration would be, or if we go to Congress, it will, will they act, number one? Number two, will they even, in an expedited fashion, consider this in a timely manner? This clearly res required an expedited response, so I think the president had existing authority. Um, but as we think about a broader strategy, in Syria, if there's further military action required, it would be appropriate for an authorization of the use of military force because right now all of our fight against ISIS, we are operating under the authorities that were post 9-11. Uh, so meant for Al-Qaeda, counter Al-Qaeda. Right, meant yeah. to a counter Al-Qaeda. And so the language they're relying on, I believe, is and associated groups. So that's pretty broad. Uh, so Congress really should reauthorize here. But the Congress has been so divided yeah. that you can see standing from an administrator, whether it was what the Obama administration went through on when, they, when the president drew the red line and came to the Congress, and then there was no action from the Congress. And so the history is not good right now for the Congress, unfortunately, really taking this responsibility and acting in more of a bipartisan manner to pass an authorization that would be sensible would be bipartisan and in something so serious you need it to be bipartisan and, bi and it won't pass the Senate unless it's bipartisan. I do want to remind the audience uh, we are collecting cards. If you have questions please write them on a card, hold it up and our folks will come around to gather those. Um, Iran, uh, briefly, there's so much going on in the world we'll never cover it all but let's follow Iran for a moment. You uh, were not a fan of the deal. That's probably an understatement. Uh, yeah, yeah oppose the <laughs> JICOA. Um, what's your view of what we should do at this point? Should we, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, reject the deal and go, with, you know, try a new direction? Or at this point, do you believe we should keep the deal and, and move mm -hmm. on to other topics? Well, I, I mean, I, I was very outspoken critic of the JCPOA. Uh, I did not think it was a good deal, and I didn't think it was strong enough. Um, and, but we are in a position right now, as you may be aware, um, the European foreign ministers are maybe meeting as we speak or yesterday or recently, and they're talking about um, what additional sanctions could be imposed in the hope uh, on Iran, in the hope of really stopping the administration from fully pulling the U.S out of the deal. And so I will say that the fact that the president was, I mean, he was clear on the campaign trail that he was against the deal, mm -hmm. that he was going to pull it. So there's no surprises here. I mean, he's following through on what he has said if he does, in fact, decide to pull us out of the deal. But I think at the moment, the threat of his willingness to do that and I, is would be helpful in getting uh, the really the, the countries that signed on to the JCPOA to, to up, up the sanctions on Iran because there are areas that were not covered by this deal that are very important in terms of their malign behavior. And Ballistic we know, missiles would be, is that well, what we're thinking? Well, and that was one I was yeah. passionate about. 
So when I was in the Senate, I introduced legislation to address their ballistic missile program. Um, their ballistic missile program is a direct threat uh, to us. And the agreement did not address the ballistic missile program, and it is an area where we could significantly increase our sanctions power into secondary sanctions that would have an impact on Iran. And so that's an area that I could see us where I would be okay with us keeping. I don't like the JCPOA, but if we could get our partners to act in a way on addressing things like the missile program that should have been included originally, and also some of the malign activity of the Revolutionary Guard, which there's some discussion of further sanctioning Iran for that behavior, that would be a positive development without, that would involve our allies. One of the problems is once we took all the sanctions, the multilateral sanctions on, we can certainly do our own action, but it's not as powerful as having the multilateral sanctions that were in place originally. So if you ask me now, I would say, let's use our maximum leverage knowing that we have a president that will in fact pull us out of the deal to deal with this missile program in terms of sanctions, tougher sanctions on Iran, and to deal with some of the malign behavior um, by the Revolutionary Guard. And if our partners aren't willing to act on that, then I would say the president should act and, and pull us out of the deal. So if they're not willing to see that he's serious about this. Bob Mueller, you're a former prosecutor. You've uh, even been rumored before as FBI director. What's your thought about the investigation and whether we should allow the investigation to continue? This is an active debate in Washington right now. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Well, I don't think there's any question that we should allow the investigation to continue. Um, and I think you've seen broad bipartisan agreement. I mean, many of my former uh, Republican colleagues have come out, whether signing on to legislation or really just saying very publicly, uh, you know, including the Senate leader, that, uh, that certainly Director Mueller should stay in this position, that the president should not take any type of... Uh, action in firing him. And I would say that, you know, the idea of firing Director Mueller really would create, if the president were to take that action, I think would create a huge problem uh, for his administration and for him. Because if you fire Mueller, it doesn't mean the investigation goes away. In fact, I would say that you would see a doubling down on a bipartisan basis from the Congress in support of uh, the investigation and even those who may have been critical of the motivations behind the investigation, I think, would support that the investigation needs to continue. Uh, m Russian malign activity in the U.S. I said we would, would return to Russia, and there, there are a lot of aspects to the Russia challenge set, but just to go to that one, you serve on a board for a news organization. You've seen as a citizen, as a politician, et cetera, and as a law enforcement official, you know, the effects of malign influence. What are your thoughts about how Americans should be thinking about um, the information they receive, the issues of privacy and security, and in particular, you know, malign actors overseas who are looking to shape our political system for their own benefit. Yeah, I think um, one of the more interesting thing, issues that the Congress is facing right now that's a really important issue for all of us is um, we've had this sort of, you know, revolution in the tech sector in terms of uh, the data that is, uh, that is being held or information that we are even giving over uh, to whether it's, you know, if you think about uh, Mark Zuckerberg's testimony um, on Facebook and, uh, but it's not just mm -hmm. Facebook, it's Facebook, it's, it's uh, Google, it's Amazon, it's other tech, you know, tools that are out there and the understanding that one of the issues the Congress I think will be looking at is does that area need more oversight, need more transparency as to how this information is being used and gathered? And, and I'm sure that they'll even consider, does it need more, some type of regulation? And it rolls into this Russian interference issue because um, I think some of the lack of transparency did allow, obviously, whether it's the Russians and potentially other malign actors, um, using 
you know, what has been a strength of ours, our, you know, technology and, you know, a big part of our economy to be able to try to interfere with our elections. So this issue of does the Congress take some kind of action, should they require more transparency on how our data is being held and how it's being used, should there be some responsibility, obviously, when there are political ads for, you know, who is funding that political ad and just like when I ran an ad during my campaign and I had to say, you know, um, this is paid for by friends of Kelly Ayotte and I approve this message, do we need to do more of that so that the American people can understand who is giving them this information so that they can judge it for itself? Do you think that regulation is coming? I think that at a minimum, transparency should be coming mm -hmm. because we don't often know how much of our information is being held, what it's being used for, and then the question becomes whether regulation of some form is needed. But the more transparency and disclosure that the American people have, I think it is, it's harder for foreign governments to influence, and it's also easier for us to be able to protect our own information if we have more transparency. We have some questions on North Korea. Uh, how do you think the president's policy of fire and fury language, if you will, have played out uh, in the North Korean crisis? And do you think there is a pathway for North Korean denuclearization? Well, they're hard questions. They're good questioners, our audience. No, these are so, great yeah. questioners. <laughs> uh, well, you know, we're in the position now uh, where we're going to undertake, and there's already been some discussions uh, with North Korea. And, you know, I think there's a school of thought that approaches that have been taken to the past in North Korea have not worked. So what do we have to lose by engaging uh, in a dialogue with North Korea on their nuclear program? I, I have to tell you that I'm not overly optimistic that we're going to get new, um, North Korea to denuclearize. And the reason I'm not optimistic about it is if you are Kim Jong-un and you look around the world and you think about you know, some of the history here, whether it's uh, Gaddafi, um, you know, whether it's uh, you know, thinking about not only Libya, but you think about Iraq, if you think about the Ukrainians under the Budapest mm -hmm. Memorandum right. giving up their nuclear weapons in exchange for security, none of it has really um, played out well. And so if you think about that leader and his ultimate goal is to hold power in his country, I'm not optimistic that we're going to get him to denuclearize. And it may be that these negotiations, as much as the goal is denuclearization, is more of a freeze on his missile programming. He's tested, in 2017, 17 intercontinental ballistic missiles tests. I mean, this is a huge issue for us because he can obviously do a lot of damage, including to uh, the U presumably we would shoot it down, but we're investing more in our missile defense program. Uh, so I'm not as optimistic that it won't be more of as much as we need, we would like to have him denuclearize, that we'll get him to do that, and we may be in more of a posture of a freeze situation. We're not going to do this unless China really decides uh, that this is important to China, too, and so engaging the Chinese uh, in these discussions and having them really put some muscle on North Korea is going to be critical or I don't see it happening and it's not clear to me yet with what is going on between us and the Chinese and the trade front uh, that how motivated they will be on this front to help us come to that outcome. Well, let's talk about that. You're on a number of uh, you know, Fortune 500 boards now. The administration's economic approach with with China does intersect, of course, the security approach. The president has come forward a little bit, if you will, on TPP of late, but what's your overall assessment of where we are and where we should be with regard to China's practices and where we should be in terms of our economic statecraft in Asia? It's really interesting because I think that the president has actually hit on a real issue in the sense that 
you know, the, the feelings of inequity with the Chinese, I mean, there have been areas as we look, um, you know, over the last decades where when it comes to intellectual property, when it comes to um, the fact that they really don't have an open market. I mean, if you do business in China, there's certain requirements of how much ownership you can have, and if you don't play by those rules, you're not going to have access to their market, and they're only going to let you have so much access to their market. Um, so this is a real issue, I think, that the president has hit on. Where I differ with him is, the, is in the approach. So uh, the approach that uh, is, I think, of real concern for us is where does this end? Um, in the sense that, you know, we issue 50 billion in, uh, in obviously tariffs, the Chinese issue 50 billion, and then we up to another 100 billion, which by the way, if you look at the trade deficit, the Chinese can't meet us if you look at the numbers. Um, and what's the end game? Because if it continues, we, uh, we are a global economy, we have multinational companies, and the way the supply chain works, um, you can't just suddenly roll back a global economy and the way things are manufactured to say, we're only going to rely on domestic steel. We're only going to basically produce things and sell them to other people when 99% of the co consumers in the world are outside the U.S. Uh, so uh, I think he's hit on a real issue, but I don't think the approach he's taken is necessarily the right approach and could lead to really a very problematic situation for our economy and almost all of our multinational companies that build stuff here, that build things here. They have a global supply chain and they're all trying to figure out, you know, question mark, what are these tariffs and how are we going to work through them? And so I hope that there's sort of some cooler heads thinking through what's the strategy to come up with some results with the Chinese on the issues we do need to address with them without causing a huge disruption to our economy. And the other piece is NAFTA, which is very, very significant because NAFTA and coming, you know, pulling out of NAFTA would have a huge impact um, on really our companies here in the United States and, and in ways that people haven't even considered. And you think about you know, the Chinese are, I mean, we talked about the Chinese issue, but the NAFTA issue is very big out there. And if we aren't able to come to some resolution there, uh, that also, I think, will have an impact uh, on many of our companies and, and their ability to employ people in the United States. There's a number of questions on, you know, I guess I characterize it as what it's like to be a U.S. ally right now. So uh, NAFTA is a good example, the NAFTA renegotiation. Uh, the Japanese, we have the president sitting down with um, Abe and the, as of this moment, at least as far as I know, um, the Japanese are still subject to tariffs, uh, haven't been accepted from the tariffs. Um, the European allies and the Iran deal you referenced before, are we getting this risk reward calculus right of sort of a lot of rough talk and transactional mm -hmm. um, approaches and just I guess assuming, or I don't know what the calculus is that the that the allies will be there. What, what's your sense of whether we we've got the 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 balance right? And if it's not right, how would you correct it? Well, I think there are times for, you know, if the if the rough talk is backed up by a thoughtful strategy, and really you're thinking about playing a game of chess and backed up with your team and also thinking through how our allies fit in this, then there are places for, uh, you know, for being tough and getting people to the table and really addressing issues. The concern I have is we've had a lot of turnover in the administration. There are a lot of unfilled positions, like for example, we are going to negotiations with North Korea. We don't yet have a nominee for ambassador to South Korea, which is very right. important. So without, you know, the team in place and more of a strategy, that's where I worry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the, the rhetoric uh, and, you know, I think many of us would like not to see the Twitter and all that, I mean, um, but, but overall, I don't think that's gonna change. But what we need to make sure is what, there is a strategy and a team to be able to execute that strategy 
where we're not surprising our allies, we're at least bringing them in on that strategy to help for a positive outcome that um, you know, doesn't leave them you know, uncertain about where we stand, uh, wondering where, whether we're going to be them, there mm -hmm. for them. And I think there still are some questions there mm -hmm. from our allies. There's a, a number of questions too from the audience on Iran. I sort of, a, I think they wish me to retread a little bit on the Iran question. So maybe I'd frame it this way. Much as you talked about what's the end state with China, the question might be, sounds like what I heard from you already is, you know, didn't like that deal. We'll keep the nuclear deal, but let's only keep it if we can get some of these other issues, ballistic missiles, for example, taken care of. But frame the strategic approach with regard to Iran. Where should we see U.S.-Iranian relations and Iran in the region? Yeah, I think that um, if we have a strategic approach to Iran, it's not just the JCPOA we have to talk about, but going back to the Syrian issue, uh, you know, they really are trying to build a land bridge, you know, from Tehran to the Mediterranean, and their influence, the stability of, in both Syria and their influence in Iraq and the region, uh, the strategy toward Iran sort of has to be a broader approach. So I would like to see us, A, it's been hanging out there for a while, impose much tougher sanctions on their missile program. Um, I, and, and I mean secondary sanctions that really I mean, sanctions can be avoided so much, and you have to really dig down if you want them to be impactful. And I would like to see us, um, you know, take action to help to make sure that we don't give them, cede that territory to them. I want to make sure that we also have strong diplomatic relations with, for example, uh, Prime Minister Abadi in Iraq so that he has a partnership with us and other Arab allies that he doesn't feel like he always has to turn to Iran. That's very important, I think, going forward uh, in Iraq. Um, you know, very important because otherwise, you know, they have a huge influence there as well. Um, and I think that in terms of Iran, we have to continue to keep the pressure up on Iran in any way that we can as possible. Just, you know, the inking of the G JCPOA was only really whether you were for it or against it in um, limiting their nuclear program. There's still so much other malign influence of Iran that has to be addressed um, beyond the nuclear program, which is obviously a huge existential threat, but, uh, but all their other, whether it's support, uh, you know, support for Hezbollah, uh, what they've done in Syria, it's just. Yeah. Global health. We, we, we've run you through the entire world, but let's bring you back to the work that you're doing here with CSIS and maybe um, talk a little bit about what got you interested in global health security and um, what you think the big issues are that maybe many Americans aren't focused on right now. Uh, health security, as I think about it, is one of those areas that we are uh, it, it is, whether it's Ebola, Zika, Zika MERS, or the next pandemic, uh, we tend to have a sort of emergency approach. It comes up, we address it, uh, and then we go on to the next thing, but we don't necessarily keep uh, the lessons from it and keep a whole of government approach that is continuous, knowing that there's going to be unfortunately, another infectious disease, and many more people will be killed by that than probably terrorism. And in conjunction with that, there is also the weaponization piece and possibility, um, you know, with these agents in, in terms of malign actors or people purposely using, uh, whether biotechnology or using agents um, against civilian populations that really makes this a very significant national security issue. And I, I'm appreciative that CSIS has decided to focus on this issue because when we met for the first time today as a commission, uh, what, what our take, one, one, a couple of our takeaways of areas that we think need focus is what is, if we had tomorrow um, an incident, is there an executable strategy that we would follow, or are we reinventing the wheel each time? You know, what is a consistent 
funding stream to address this immediately so we aren't having another fight in the Congress um, over funding for, for example, Ebola, where when I was in the Congress that was an issue. And you know, third, who's in charge? Who's gonna lead this effort? Because um, these types of incidents can spread very quickly, can sicken thousands and thousands of people. They cross continents. Uh, you know, essentially these, if you think about pandemics, they don't care what country you live in in the sense that uh, the boundaries mean nothing. And so what, what is our response? So hopefully the work that is CSIS is doing on this will come away with some very clear usable recommendations on, okay, what's, what it, who's in charge? How do we do this? And we're also talking about making sure that we can engage both the Congress and administration in tabletop exercises on this. If we have an incident, here's what we do so that we're not reinventing it again if something happens. Because I, I guarantee, I hate to say this, I shouldn't say guarantee, but we'll be talking about another um, health issue that comes up that has a threat to our country. And not starting here, but starting in, unlikely to start here, I hope, um, but starting in some other country that has the potential of coming here. Are you open to running for public office again? You've had quite a career and you've got a lot of time <laughs> left. Uh, have you thought about it? I have not thought about it. I can tell you right now because very much um, enjoying, I've got kids that are 10 and 13 and so um, it's been fun to spend more time with them. Uh, but you know, I, I love serving and the ability to make a difference is certainly something that's been a big part of my life for 20 years. So I never say never, but I have not been thinking about it at all. And honestly, <laughs> it's easier not to think about it when I look at some of the things happening yes, down here. <laughs> yes, I'm, sh I'm sure Washington is not making yeah. itself uh, <laughs> exactly. you know, uh, uh, something to be missed. Well, uh, Senator Kelly, I, I wanna thank you for your time today for your um, in incredible willingness, as I said, to travel the entire globe practically in this conversation. We did not get to nearly you know, a third of the questions in here, but I'm gonna give them to you in case you wanna look at them so you have them for later thought. And uh, please join me in thanking Senator Ayotte for her time today. Thank you.